Hi everyone, my name is Lindsay Glasner. I am telling me to remove that window. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Um, welcome to tonight's webinar. I keep getting a pop up there, that's unusual. Thank you so much for attending tonight's webinar. Do you see the window on here? Yes, you do. It's blocking that off. Okay, let me, let me minimize. Just, uh, Working on some technical difficulties here. There we go. Is that off your screen now? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Kelly's sitting right next to me. Um, I'm Lindsay Glaster. I'm here with Kelly Schaefer. We are with the Birds of K through 12 group. So she's kind of my second screen over here to make sure we don't have any technical difficulties, which is possible since we are using or still becoming used to our program Zoom. So in tonight's webinar, we're going to be discussing dissecting the food web in an LPL investigation. I'm going to turn my video off now, but I figure I just put a face to the name. I want to welcome you all personally, and we're going to have some fun tonight with the interactive webinar. So let me just stop the video, and we'll progress onwards. So as I said, we are using the Zoom platform. Um, when I share a screen, it's to our understanding that it will automatically go to full size. To escape the full size and be able to access the chat window easily, you can just hover on the top button right there and go down to exit the full screen or just press the escape button. When you do that, uh, we recommend opening the chat window. We will have a lot of chat discussions during this webinar. When using the chat window, please select everyone not all panelists. We, Like I said, it will be interactive and we want you to share your discussions with everyone to help foster a nice inquiry process. So with tonight's webinar, before we begin, I want to test that chat window out. And if you could please introduce yourself, what type of educator you are, and whether you, you have dissected owl pellets with your students before. We'll give you a few minutes, we'll see uh, what kind of audience we have tonight. Vanessa, I'm glad you're able to uh, do this when you're commuting on. I'm glad you got this work today. Ian, welcome. Katrina, welcome. Sheena, welcome. Ken, Joshua, wonderful. Buffalo, New York, so that's right around the corner from us. Arkansas, Colorado, North Carolina, Barbara in Minneapolis. Well, welcome everyone. Thank you guys for joining us tonight. And we're very excited that you are here and we'll be discussing some fun owl pellet uh, content. A quick introduction to Kelly and myself. We are employees here with the Cornell Lab of Ornithology associated with Cornell University. The Lab of Ornithology is a membership driven institution and our mission is to interpret and conserve the Earth's biological diversity through research, education and citizen science focused on birds. This is our beautiful lab here. Kelly and I are somewhere in the back hidden right there and it's pitch black out but we're still very excited to still be in this wonderful building. And then Kelly and myself we are specifically with the Birds of K-12 program here at the lab. So essentially we take all the knowledge and research that's happening at the lab and create innovative resources and training opportunities that build science skills while inspiring young people to connect to local habitats, explore biodiversity, and engage in citizen science projects. Now, at any point in time, feel free to use the chat win to, window to ask any questions, fill in any recommendations for activities. Kelly will monitor that. She'll let me know ahead of time if somebody pops up a good question that we should answer to the entire group, or if somebody provides recommendations on how to adapt lessons for different age groups. We want to share that with everybody so we make this as beneficial webinar as possible. So in this webinar, what we're going to cover, we are first going to be discussing the owl pellet uh, dissection kit. So it's dissecting the food web and owl pellet investigation. And we really want to focus on introducing the kit, but making sure that 
you don't actually need to own the kit currently or buy the kit in the future for you to gain useful information from today's webinar. So we'll be talking a lot about um, some interesting facts about webinars. We'll be differentiating the difference between a food chain versus a food web, focusing on trophic levels and how to discuss trophic levels with students. We also want to understand why owls are an important species to study and how studying owl pellets will better allow us to understand ecosystem interactions. And then throughout the webinar, I'll make NGSS and CCSS standard uh, connections and we'll finish off with some extra resources available for different age groups. Now, by interactively building a food web, students are able to experience how energy flows through an ecosystem. And that's the main focus of our owl pellet investigation kit. It's all about focusing on the interconnectedness of species and how changes in populations of one species can ripple through an entire ecosystem. Dissecting an owl pellet and comparing habitats and feeding preferences of three different owl species gives students insight into how species survive, compete, and interact. Now our kit was designed for grades third through seventh. We do also have high school extension questions on our website and I'll also provide some um, lower elementary extensions at the end of the webinar with some uh, reading opportunities. But this entire kit does provide the full curriculum, the pellets that are needed to dissect, the containers to hold the pellets, tweezers and utensils, um, handouts, student journals, all dissecting materials, and it is all tied to the next generation science standards and the Common Core state standards. And that full uh, standards correlation, that um, alignment, is listed entirely within the first few pages of the curriculum kit. Now, this kit full retail price is around $145, and that comes as the entire kit. But we do also offer the replenishment kits for all the consumable materials, like the owl pellets, as well as we do sell the curriculum booklet separately if you find um, other means of purchase or if you have your own owl pellets and collect them yourself. Now, because each can be sold separately, this um, we have that on our website, and we'll take you to that website immediately after the webinar, which has all the basic information around this kit. So our webinar is focused on the kit, but again, we really want to focus on this idea that you don't need to own the kit to be able to really engage students with owl pellets and owl pellet dissections. Now that's my final plug for the kit so far. Um, why even choose owls as a study subject? And that's obviously a very good question to start off with. Of course, Kelly, myself, and us at the Lab of Ornithology were a bit biased because owls are really cool, uh, but they naturally draw the interest of any age group. Anywhere between young or old, owls are just fascinating. And they develop some really cool adaptations that we can study. So when thinking about adaptations, owls develop those adaptations based on the habitat that they live in. Now, the gray horned owl you might actually find in the habitat such as this picture, uh, woods, maybe some young woods interspersed with fields or other open areas. But gray horned owls do have a broad range of habitats they use, and this includes deciduous and evergreen forests, swamps, deserts, tundra edges, tropical rainforests, even cities, orchards, suburbs, and parks. So with such diversity of habitat, I want us to first just start thinking about the adaptations that this great horned owl has developed to survive. Now using a chat box, I want you to list some of the adaptations that you think the great horned owl has to help it survive. I love that, Mary. Harry Potter, kids are so fascinated by owls, definitely true. I'm still a Harry Potter geek myself. <laughs> I will always love Hedwig. Okay, silent flight, tufts on the head, large ears for nocturnal hunting, large feet and talons. They have a very keen eyesight with a silent flight. They're cool horns that make it look like branches, the large eyes, 
Camouflage. The feathers for camouflage, yes. The face shape. That's actually somebody, something that nobody mentioned last night. Mm -hmm. So glad we're bringing up some new content. Neck that can turn far distances, the keen hearing, asymmetrical ears. You guys are on top of it. Last night we didn't quite get all this information. This is great. So when we think about the adaptations that just a great horned owl has alone, many of these can also be applied to other animals, such as a, a specific face shape to help with um, the hearing opportunities, the asymmetrical ears also with hearing, um, the large eyes for seeing uh, during dawn, dusk, nocturnal times. I love how somebody mentioned the large talons. Great horned owls have huge talons. Those guys can pick up a very large prey. They can um, even take down other, other owls. They can take away your cat if they wanted to. They're incredibly, incredibly deadly when it comes to that. And then some other camouflage, yes. The ear tufts, oftentimes we call the great horned owls because of those ear tufts. And kids will think that those are actually their ears, when in fact they aren't their ears. Somebody made a good point. They almost look like it's a way to help them camouflage with the branches. So these are all great opportunities to start thinking about owl adaptations. And it's a great starting point when introducing the concept of owls and the habitat that you might find owls in. So let's start diving into our lessons. With such a diversity of habitat, what adaptations does a great horned owl have to survive? And then after we started utilizing, coming up with some of those ad adaptations, a common one that the last few people have talked about were the sharp beak as a means of being able to rip apart prey, which actually isn't the case with many animals, or sorry, is not the case with many owls. And that's actually something we talk about in the second lesson when we focus on the production of an owl pellet. One of the advantages of dissecting an owl pellet is because owls don't actually rip apart their prey, they tend to just eat their prey whole, and they're not crushing the skeleton. And that allows us to truly be able to study the skeleton and reproduce and replicate what the owl has been eating. And that allows us to understand and start recreating that food web. So the main theme of our first lesson, the food web, is all about focusing on the energy in an ecosystem and how it flows through plants and animals that live there. We specifically break down the difference between food chains and food webs and we wanted to demystify the concepts of trophic levels. Our main goal is to have students demonstrate their understanding of a food web by being able to predict what may happen to all the organisms when there's a disruption in the ecosystem. Let's start with the foundation, the food chain. The term food chain refers to a natural system by which energy is transmitted from one organism to another. And the primary source of the energy is coming from the sun. So the food chain has the four main elements, the sun, which is again, the primary source of energy. We'll have the producers, and these are the organisms that produce their own food using the sun as the base of the food chain. And through photosynthesis, they are converting light energy to um, chemical energy stored as carbohydrates. These producers are plants, algae, cyanobacteria, and those are the main producers. Consumers, these are organisms that eat or consume other organisms for energy. Some consumers are herbivores and eat only plants. Other consumers are carnivores, so they're going to only eat meat. And then we have the omnivores eating both plants and meat. Finally, there are the parasites and scavengers. Those are also consumers. We don't want those to confused with our final group, which is the decomposers. And the decomposers are the bacteria and fungi that break down the waste and dead plants and animals. And they're an important part of the food chain because they convert the dead matter into nitrogen and carbon that's recycled back into the ecosystem. Food webs show how plants and animals are connected by many food chains. And this illustrates a more complex flow of energy. 
Species are interconnected in the food web, as shown here on the left. If one species is removed, it can affect an entire ecosystem. So to demonstrate the complexity of the food web, we take students through a food web tangle game here on the right. Using string to represent the flow of energy, students create their own food web using the animals found on the poster. So within the curriculum kit, we provide little name tag cards for every single animal on our poster here on the left. The students will wear the animal name tag and it lists um, what eats them and what they eat. And that allows the students, gives them the content background to create this food web tangle. Recognizing consumers aren't dependent on one food source, like it's demonstrated in the food chain, uh, is very important for these students. And once they make that connection, they're able to discuss more difficult questions. This leads us into discussing trophic levels. And this is a further extension, especially for older audiences. Now, when we look at a trophic level, we have here producers at the bottom, primary consumers, secondary consumers, and tertiary consumers. And what are the differences? How does energy pass between the different levels? And more importantly, how do the levels interact with each other on an ecosystem level? These are all questions to be discussed when thinking about trophic levels and the complexity of a food web. So I'm gonna give you guys a scenario, and I want you to share how you think this scenario will impact each trophic level. Here's the scenario. An insecticide has been sprayed on a large scale in a town that takes pride in all of its flowers. So they don't want insects to eat the flowers or leaves. They want them to stay looking beautiful. Now with that, how would spraying of the insecticide impact the primary, secondary, and tertiary consumers of this trophic level? So I want you to share your thoughts in the chat window. I'll give you a few minutes to write down those thoughts. Okay, so we're looking at tertiary consumers might be affected the most due to biomagnification, insects die out, so there are fewer secondary consumers. Um, the insects will not survive, populations at all trophic levels will decrease, the toxins will travel through the levels, there could be a buildup of pesticides through the trophic levels, reduced available food. Yes, many of these are all viable options that could happen. And that's what we really want to look at when thinking about the trophic levels. There isn't necessarily one right solution, but it's a great opportunity to start a discussion on what might happen. So based off of your comments, we have two different options. The first option could be that the insecticide levels um, may not kill off all insects, but it may cause a biomagnification of insecticide or poison going up through these trophic levels. So we might have a small amount of insecticide present in our producers. Um, that would increase between our primary consumers because they're eating uh, a substantial larger number of producers. For the um, wolf spider here, the wolf spider will have to eat multiple uh, grasshoppers and butterflies, and that would biomagnify, bioaccumulate the amount of toxins present in the wolf spider, and then say a peregrine falcon here was eating the wolf spider again, they'd have to eat several wolf spiders to um, satisfy their hunger level, which would also increase the number of toxins in the tertiary level. So essentially, the toxin is um, magnifying its level as it goes up through the consumer trophic levels. The second option we might have is that the insecticide could truly kill our insects, leaving us with a reduced number, let's see if I can draw here, a reduced number of prey opportunities. So 
we've lost our worms, we've lost our caterpillars, we've lost our butterflies and our grasshoppers. And this might be impacting as well our beetles and our wolf spiders. And um, this might also help, uh, not help, it would hurt and decrease our tertiary consumer numbers as well. So population levels on all higher consumers uh, would be decreasing due to this insecticide. Now, another scenario can be used as well. Let's put a different scenario out. I wanna comment, let's see if there are any comments real quick on this. Yes. Um, one other opportunity or another scenario that we can play off is a top-down approach, a trophic cascade from the top down. And this is us looking at the tertiary consumers. And let's make an example that they have such gorgeous feathers because they do. And that has started a market for owl and um, predator feathers. Therefore, a lot of hunters are going out and killing these tertiary consumers and killing them for their feathers. So how would a decrease in population at the tertiary level impact our secondary consumers, primary consumers, and producers? So we'll start, the tertiary consumers are decreasing in population. What happens to the other population? Yeah, so very basic starting point. They're gonna, with the tertiary consumers going down, they're gonna put the predator-prey relationship out of balance. Yes, so we are gonna have several different things happening. Population of lower order prey increases um, possibly beyond capacity. And that's a common example. So we're reducing our tertiary consumer population. That's going to lead to less predators for our secondary consumers. With less predators, they're going to actually have an increased population because nobody's going to be preying on them. With an increased population of our secondary consumers, that's a larger population number. So they're going to need a more prey to feed all the mouths of those secondary consumers because that population is increased. Because there are more predators in the secondary consumers, that means we're going to have less prey in the primary consumers. All these secondary consumers are gonna be eating all the primary consumers, which will reduce that population. In the process, we may also then see an increase in producers because we're going to have less mice and birds um, and insects feeding on the producers, but we may also see a decrease in the producers too. A uh, great point that was made is that with a decrease potentially in insects, we may also have a decrease in pollinators in general, which could also reduce uh, producer, pop, uh, producer populations. So that producer is a little iffy. Um, and again, these are more on the hypothetical base. So the true complexity will all depend on the actual ecosystem and the true predator-prey interactions that are happening. But yes, primary, primary consumers could be a reduction of pollination. That's correct, Ken. So yes, this is a great opportunity to start having all these conversations with the students and learners that you work with. Um, I specifically, we talk about trophic cascades and all these interactions at the college level, but this can easily be inter um, intertwined within the high school and middle school level as well. So that's our main focus with the first lesson. It's all about the basic foundation of what a food chain is, the complexities of food webs, and then providing those extension and discussion questions, which are meeting a lot of the common core standards and the next generation standards through talking about the food web and the interconnectedness between there. Now, lesson two is helping students further connect owls into the food web discussion. In this lesson, we focus on how owls are top predators and we can study what they eat through their pellets. Now, scientists use the pellets to learn about owls' health, behavior patterns, population, and prey. This information helps us learn about the ecosystems in which owls live. Owls, before we can even get started, I mean, this is all about digging into owl pellets, so I wanna introduce how owl pellets are formed 
And I will show you a fun video about that. So owls are often swallowing their prey whole. We've discussed this, that they're not ripping apart their prey like many other predators. Instead, they're gonna swallow their prey whole because their beaks really aren't powerful enough to rip their prey apart. This keeps the skeleton from getting broken. Owl stomach juices are also very weak, which means owls can only digest the soft parts of their prey. So the pellets are made of bones, fur, feathers, teeth, uh, even exoskeletons of insects. And it's possible to tell what an owl has eaten because of the pellet. These hard parts are condensed to form the pellet and the owl coughs that up or regurgitates it. The owl's prey goes into the stomach. Soon digested juices begin to dissolve the meat and other digestible materials, allowing them to continue into the intestines. Meanwhile, the indigestible material stays in um, the stomach where the mucus action, muscle action, I should say, um, compacts the material into a pellet. Now, in order to spit out this pellet, it must travel up to the mouth from the stomach. So a slippery mucus covers the pellet and helps the owl cough it up. It usually takes at least six hours for an owl to produce and regurgitate a pellet after it eats it. And the pellets in this kit are all from wild barn owls. So they are extra large to help with young learners, but because they're from wild barn owls, there's a greater diversity of prey that can be found. Now I wanna show what it looks like for an owl regurgitating a pellet. There is no sound to this video. There's no gross sound of it coming up. But if you are squeamish and you think that this is going to uh, irritate you or potentially cause some unpleasant feelings, feel free to look away. I'll tell you when it's done. Okay. Pull this up here. So this is a video of a barred owl chick regurgitating a pellet. Look at that cute face looking right at you. Little do you know, it's coming. Voila, an owl pellet. It's as easy as that. You can still see it a little slimy and wet. That's all the mucus covering to help it come out. Does the owl make a noise when the owl pellet comes out? Wait, no, this guy shows two mouths. Ah, so the other area is the compacted portion. Um, the, sorry, the compacted, not portion. The chamber in which the pellet is compacted together. I guess that's, is that the proper way to call it? I don't know if the, yeah, I don't really know what the technical term for that is. Kelly's gonna Google the technical term because I don't know it off the top of my head and she will put it in the chat window for you, Linda. That's a very good question. I just, it's slipping my mind right now. Um, okay, now how to get back. Ha, excellent. So that's a basic introduction to how pellets are formed. And we go through this entire process with students using our owl pellet fact sheet. The regurgitation is silent. Yes. So through the owl pellet fact sheet, the entire process is all explained there, but this is all for students to read through the process and we encourage them to actually understand the dissect or the um, pellet formation process before they dissect so they actually know what they are expecting to see and what they are digging into. And that's the fun part, it's digging into the owl pellets. Now you'll notice none of our students are wearing gloves. All of our owl pellets are sterilized prior to, to distribution, so it isn't necessary to wear them. Um, some teachers do do that, some per students prefer to wear gloves, it's all personal choice and what you'd like to do with your students. But when starting the, the dissection process, we focus on all the observational skills. This means having students measure size and shape, coloration, texture, even drawing a two-scale model of the pellet itself. 
From there, it's a patient process of breaking apart the pellet and discovering the mystery inside. So students will likely find a variety of skulls and bones within the pellet. And we provide a series of handouts to guide the learner through that identification process. You'll see in this picture right below, this is a um, bone identification chart. So we have a series of prey that are likely to be found within an owl pellet, including uh, shrews, voles, um, birds, uh, mice, I think. I, it's all slipping through my head right now. Black. Six variety of uh, prey items and providing the different bones and identifying the bones and all the drawings of those that are all within the pellet content charts to help the students identify them. And we also provide a skull dichotomous key. Now, the entire process for um, dissecting an owl pellet and better understanding what they're likely to find and the prey that they're eating really comes down to the component of identifying the prey. And that leads to the skulls. Now, using a skull dichotomous key, students are able to identify between six likely prey species the owls consumed. So I want us to try out this dichotomous key together. Here's the full dichotomous key seen here on the right. And it's hard to read all those um, instructions. So I do want to start off with just the basis, basics, I should say. Um, and we'll go to just the first two options. Now, we have the skull, and I want you to skull on the right-hand side, or left-hand side. Uh, use the skull on the left-hand side and go through the first stages of the psychotomous key. And I want you in the chat window to tell me what you've ended up with, either with a bird, um, go to three, or go to four. Okay, let's see what people are saying. Go to four, go to four, go to four. Yes, so if we were actually looking at um, our actual dichotomous key, the go to four, let me pull it back up real quick, see if we can see it. Our go to four down here, we're gonna look next at the, Hard to see in there. I'll pull it up on the sheet. Um, the cheek teeth, are they angled or lobed? So if we stay in it, go to three just by chance. Um, we'll go through this right now, actually. The skull does not have teeth or holes for teeth. Well, the skull clearly has teeth right here on this mandible, so it's definitely not a bird. Birds don't have teeth. Uh, teeth, wow. Birds don't have teeth. So we'd automatically have to choose 1B. Skull has a teeth, so we're going to go to 2. So the 2, skull does not have a diastema. And that's a gap between the front and cheek teeth. Now, when I first looked at the skull, I don't have much owl pellet dissection experience myself. And I was quite confused thinking, oh, it must be go to 3. I'm only seeing these teeth right here. But upon closer inspection, we see these are our front incisors right here. Um, both the yellow coloration between these back teeth um, and right here in the front. So this skull does have that diastema or that gap. This is the diastema right here, the gap between um, the back, the cheek teeth and the front teeth. Now this skull is a vole skull and we can tell that because it um, has angled teeth. And again, that comes within the skull or dichotomous key. It di differentiates between lobed and angled teeth. So this is a vole skull we took here. And vole skulls are the probably one of the most common prey within owl pellets. But again, because these are all wild owl pellets that we provide in the kit, there will be a greater diversity. <clears throat> Once identifying the animal, students can also reconstruct an entire prey skeleton using the bones that they've dissected and identified. So again, this is the pellet content charts where it goes through different teeth um, 
the different types of teeth, talks about the mandible, and identifies a variety of bones where it looks like, okay, rats, voles, I don't know what that middle one, M is, uh, shrews, mice, birds, I guess I can just look right in the curriculum right here. Um, rats, voles, mouse, shrews, moles, and birds. There you go. Um, <clears throat> Now, again, we provide the pellet content charts to show you how to identify the bones, but it's really the fun of trying to identify the bones of the pellets and then placing them within the skeleton reconstruction page. So once students actually start to identify and reconstruct their skeleton, it might look something like this on the right-hand side. Now, final, finally, we finish with a compare and contrast analysis between three owl species the barn owl, the great horned owl, and the eastern screech owl. Different owls eat different prey based on factors such as their preferred habitat, when they're active, their size, the season, and prey availability in the area. Due to these differences, we create some unique analyses and predictions. So I want us to get to know these three owl species better. On the left, I have an eastern screech owl. This is the smallest of our three owls, and it's between six to 10 inches in length. The middle owl is our barn owl, and this is the owl that does provide the pellets for our study. It's a medium-sized owl between 12 to 16 inches, and then we have our largest owl on the right, the great horned owl, and it's standing tall between 18 to 25 inches. Now, I have eight questions prepared, and I want to do a quick poll with these questions to allow us to become better acquainted with our three owl species. With each statement, I'm going to put up the poll, and I want you to select the owl you think the statement belongs to. I'll give you three minutes for, to complete the statement. So you guys should have a poll pop up right now. Excellent. I'll give you guys three minutes. Okay, you have about a minute left to complete the poll. Great, I'm glad you think it was fun, Linda. I personally like the last question of which owl is the coolest, because I do tell people there is a correct answer to that. I know. <laughs> there's totally a correct answer. You'll find out at the end. We'll go over all the answers. You guys have about 30, second left, 30 seconds left, so get your uh, polls in. Oh, don't, it's not a stressful. Don't make them stress, Kelly. We're not doing a do, 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 do. 
Melody, thank you. We try and make it as interactive as possible. Be perfectly blunt, my bedtime is 8 p.m. So if this is not an interactive webinar, I'm gonna be passed out. <laughs> this keeps me awake. Okay, I am ending the polling. Last chance entering and answer, done. Okay, let's look at the results. It should be sharing on your screen right now. Our first poll. So, I am a powerful predator that can catch large prey. My talons are so big, you better keep your cat indoors. Yeah, we had to do this in SAS. And I'm glad that every single person was listening to me at the beginning of the webinar because I did make that subtle comment that the great horned owl is going to take your cat away. So, keep your cats indoors, ladies and gents. That's the lesson of that poll. I am the most widely distributed species of owl. I live on every continent except Antarctica. There's a little bit of a, a between the eastern screech owl, great horned owl, and barn owl, but this is the barn owl. They are the widest distributed owl species between our three um, and the most widely distributed owl species of all. The eastern screech owl is only found within the eastern United States, Canada, and a bit of Mexico. The great horned owl is found throughout North America and into South America. Uh, number three, crows gather from near and far to yell at me for hours. The crows have a good reason for this. I'm their most dangerous predator. And this is the great horned owl. We have uh, one of the world's leading crow experts, Kevin McGowan, who is in charge of our long distance learning program here at the lab. But on his free time, he has been studying social behaviors of crows for the last two decades. He is a crow fanatic. And we always get some wonderful stories from him, how he'll go check crow's nests and we'll all of a sudden see decapita decapitated crows and he knows that a great horned owl has visited. Next, number four, even though I eat European starlings, a starling might take over my nest and lay its own eggs in it. Yes, this is the Eastern screech owl, well done. Five, I strictly hunt at night compared to my fellow owls who also hunt at dusk dawn and sometimes even during the day this is a tricky one so it's not the eastern screech owl the eastern screech owl does is the one species that does hunt occasionally during the day and it's between the barn owl and the great horned owl and the winner is the barn owl the barn owl is a strict night hunter um, the great horned owl tends to prefer hunting at dusk and dawn and during the night as well but mostly during that dusk and dawn time period Number six, I have two color morphs, gray and red. The majority of you got that right. That's Eastern Screech Owl. Um, the most common morph, two thirds of the population is the gray morph. Uh, the red morph is about one third of the population, but that's predominantly along the actual coast, not towards the um, Mississippi part of the United States. Number seven, my ability to locate prey by sound alone is the best of any animal that has been tested. We have a tie, Kelly. This is the first time. It's between the barn owl and the great horned owl. The winner is, drum roll, the barn owl. The barn owl does have the best opportunity to locate prey by sound alone um, of any animal that has been tested. So that's the key part, it has been tested. Of any animal that has been tested. Finally, I'm the coolest owl of them all. Well, 43% of you got this right because it is the great horned owl. They are the coolest owl of them all. My preference. But Choose the owl that your heart loves. Don't listen to Lindsay. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was just a fun question to see. Great horned owl won last night too, but Eastern Screech Owl was popular in this group. Many people didn't do that last night. So thank you guys for taking our poll. Actually, I think you need to stop sharing the poll results. We'll close that out. And I hope you guys didn't feel too stressed with that little poll. Many of these facts that we actually talk about are all found within our OWL fact sheets. So lesson three is all about comparing the habitat, the behavior, the food of these three different owls and seeing how that might impact differences in owl pellets what they would dissect in owl pellets, and how that could lead to other questions around 
the food web and the ecosystem. And this is bringing in a lot of those common core standards between comparing and contrasting, um, analyzing and interpreting data and making uh, predictions based on that information. So all the information that we discussed is in the OWL palette fact sheets, but it goes even further within those and allows students to get an inside look into the life of these cool species and how that would be impacted within their OWL pellet. So with that said, those are our, that's our OWL pellet kit right there. I'm going to talk about a few more um, extension opportunities. I'm going to keep an eye on the chat window just to see if there are any questions. Do we have any curriculum on vultures? We don't have anything specifically on vultures, but we do have a free download called Investigating Evidence. And that actually has students look at a case study of understanding how vultures hunt, whether it's between sight versus sound. And that's a really op awesome opportunity of studying and looking at the study between vultures and sight and sound that was done by Audubon himself ages ago and replicated on many occasions to try and find the answer. Um, or recommendations of good comparisons with OWL as an extension activity. You know, let us ponder on that and we'll see if we can come up a, off the top of our heads a good extension activity by the end of this, Mary. Okay, so I want to talk about just a few other examples. Again, this OWL pellet kit that we mentioned is focused for the third through seventh grade with high school extensions. For those in the K through two age group, I do recommend looking at our books and activities page, which is um, has a new book called on there called White Owl Barn Owl. Now, it provides a lot of different activities, and the story of the White Owl Barn Owl is following a granddaughter grandfather combo who become interested in this barn owl that they saw in a back field. They build a nest box uh, for the barn owl and eventually the barn owl comes and they watch it hunt through the night. And it provides a wonderful opportunity for younger age groups to start to focus and better understand owl adaptations, barn owl adaptations specifically, as well as barn owl biology. So looking at information and relating the information from the book, like um, barn owls nest in old buildings or hollow trees. They revisit favorite perches. They swallow their prey whole. They produce pellets. Um, they have eyes that are designed to allow them to see in low light. Their heart-shaped facial desk, as well as their ears are holes in their skeleton, um, in their skull. So this is just a very simple and easy activity um, the book can be found typically in many of your school libraries or public libraries. You can also purchase it for like 10 bucks on Amazon, I think. But all the activities are free on our website that are associated with this book. And I'll have Kelly share the link to that book if she hasn't already on the website or in the chat window. The next activity I recommend for any age group is owl nest boxes. And this is inspired by our White Owl Barn Owl book but the opportunity to try and actually attract owls into your local area. This is a screenshot of our Citizen Science Project webpage, NestWatch, it's nestwatch.org. Kelly will share the link in the chat window, but it'll also be on the next slide. And within the NestWatch website, you have the opportunity to go onto their Learn tab and be able to search the, um, nest box plan for different species of birds. Now you can search individual species of birds or what I prefer is the right box right bird plan where you type in your um, general region and your general habitat and based on your region and habitat they'll provide you a full list of birds that would use nest boxes in your area. What I specifically like is they will tell you the construction difficulty between one being easy and three being difficult. So this eastern screech owl is a moderate level. They'll also tell you which um, nest boxes can be kid friendly. So if I recall off the top of my head, there's a great horned owl nest box plan and that's actually a kid friendly plan you can use. The best part about this that I really like is they'll tell you if this species is in decline for your region. 
specifically. Um, so I know for, I think I put in um, the New England area and the Northeast area, and um, I think I put forest, I guess, probably for this habitat. And it came up right away, the Eastern Screech Owl is a species in decline for our area. And I just type in my email and give me the whole construction plan for that nest box. Along with yard map and those nest box plans, it not only provides you all the dimensions and materials you need, it will tell you the time of year you should put the nest box up to ensure that it um, can be seen when they are searching for nest boxes. It will tell you the height to put it on, what to mount it on, um, a variety of factors to help ensure that your nest box is successful. So this is all through the Nest Watch site. The website is right down here at the bottom, and Kelly has also shared it in the text or in the chat window. Going further past building an owl pelt or an owl nest box, I do encourage you to monitor nest boxes, whether they're owls or just nests in general. Um, nest Watch is a full citizen science project where you can monitor nesting birds. You become a certified nest monitor. You'll visit a nest box or um, active nest every three to four days, and it's a wonderful opportunity. The final piece of information I want to leave you is our Birdsooth Investigator Student Publication Magazine. This is our 2016 magazine, and it has this gorgeous owl right on the cover. But going past just doing simple activities, you can consider encouraging your students to do inquiry projects and investigations around owls. So I want to share two investigations that students have done in our 2013 and 2015 student publication magazine. And this is a magazine all science report and artwork for students by students. So here is a true experiment done. This is by Gwenna, Jacob, and Brandon, sixth graders and Maine. And their experiment was how birds react to predator calls. And so they specifically studied birds that were visiting the bird feeders. Um, when they noticed a, a few amount of birds at the bird feeder, they'll play one of four different predator calls and would see how the birds would react to each predator calls. Now, the four predator calls they tested were a bald eagle, a peregrine falcon, a merlin, and a short-eared owl. And what they found, they had five birds visit a bird feeder um, prior to the short-eared owl call. As soon as they played it, every single bird left the feeder and didn't come back. And so it's just one easy way to start testing um, how birds react to different predator calls. It's a nice experiment for them to set up, especially with the school feeders. Um, the next experiment I want to show you is actually not a true experiment like the previous one. It's a data exploration opportunity. This was done by Alex, who's a seventh grader in Minneapolis, and he studied the correlation between the number of raptor species and songbird species in 2012. And this was published, I believe, in our, yes, in our 2013 magazine. And so it's another opportunity where you don't actually have to design full experiments, where you can still have an owl focus and just study um, data available. And this is all through our eBird Citizen Science um, database. With that, we've talked about a lot of information. So we've gone through our entire owl pellet kit. We've learned some fun facts about owls. We've watched a, a barred owl chick regurgitate an owl pellet. Um, and we've also talked about some other extension resources. So Kelly and I will take any information, or sorry, any questions you may have, but I do encourage you to keep in touch with us. While we're looking for any questions, I'm gonna put up an exit survey poll. If you wouldn't mind providing us some feedbacks or sending us an email with some feedback on how you thought you liked this webinar or didn't like this webinar, what you'd improve about the webinars, or what topics you'd want to see for future webinars, please let us know. We'd be happy to um, come up and look at all that information. So I'm going to browse through the chat window with Kelly, and we'll see what we can, um, what, if there's anything we can find or questions we can answer. Oh, the eBird Science Database. It is eBird.org. Kelly will put that in the chat window right now. 
Ian, thanks so much. Greatly appreciate you coming out. Oh, that's a good question, Mary. Is there a way to teach students how to spot owl pellets in the wild? I guess the first thing would be is to, um, my first recommendation would be to determine where owls are commonly found in a region near you because there won't be any owl pellets unless there are owls there. And so being able to find a common um, roosting spot for owls would be my first suggestion. And that can be done by looking through the eBird database. Um, if you're interested in exploring that, they have a big explore tab. You can explore by species, um, and that can provide you a species map, and you can see different sightings and reportings. You can also reach out to a local rehabilitation center or um, Audubon site, and they tend to have really good tracking. Melanie created a great suggestion looking for whitewash on roosting trees and the pellets would be at the base. So those are all options. Can you tell which owl regurgitated the pellet by sight? I'm not aware of that. Um, I'm not an owl pellet expert, I will say, based off of sight or sound. Mm -hmm. um, my, I do suspect and I predict that you can tell um, general size based on the pellet uh, to determine the species. But if you had a whole array of pellets in front of you and didn't know what region they came from, it'd be hard to tell the difference. How can you tell if you have enough prey and cover for an owl at our small town school site? Good question, Valerie. If, if you're looking, if you're thinking about doing owl nest boxes, and that's why you're asking, um, the nest watch site is going to give you lots of great information about the type of habitat that is ideal for the nest box. So you can use that to judge whether your site meets those needs or not. Yeah, that would be a great thing. The other um, recommendation I would see is uh, talk around and see if there are other people are seeing owls in your area. My guess is you still might be able to attract owls. It may take a little bit of time, but you should be able to. Are there disease concerns if you have wild owl pellets, but do not sterilize them first? I would say, as with anything, you should be careful yes. that if you're doing that, you want gloves. But I, I would recommend using the sterilized pellets. Yeah, and as with all pellets, I mean, our pellets are sterilized, but there are still common practices that we talk about in the curriculum that we do recommend. Um, don't dissect the pellets in anywhere that you eat food. Wash the table afterwards on eating, um, on um, after dissecting the owl pellet. So. Those are, those are also recommendations we provide. Are there other questions? You're welcome to, at any point in time, leave the webinar if you think you're done. I wanna thank you all again for um, joining us. We'll keep answering questions as well. For the most part, I think that owls are not going to interfere with your hummingbirds. Um, hummingbirds actually have been known to nest under predator nests because they're not really the target of the prey uh, of those predators, and they get extra protection from that. So I wouldn't I wouldn't let that be a concern that stops you. Um, the nature is really good about figuring out how to partition things, and I think your hummingbirds and your your owl nest boxes would be a fine complement to each other. Mm -hmm. um, Holly's asking if there's a simple home process for sterilizing the pellets. Somebody earlier said oven. I don't personally feel confident of providing a recommendation because I don't have experience with it and I don't want you to get any kind of sickness or issues. So um, somebody recommend that, but I personally have no process to recommend to you. Thanks for coming out, Haley. Do you know Haley? I do know Haley. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, again. It looks like we're having some people um, head out. But again, Kelly and I will hang out, answer any questions you have. You can always reach us in, um, via email. Kelly and I monitor that general email address. 
Um, we do also offer a certificate of completion. If you'd like, feel free to send us an email. We can also give you a certificate of completion.